Judge Bonello, your father, Vincenzo, was a passionate nationalist and he faced significant adversity for his belief, including internment and exile by the British, of course. And how, how, have, how did his experiences and stories influence your views on nationalism and human rights? I don't believe that there was a direct influence by the injustices my father suffered. Uh, I believe that, all in all, uh, my father ta taught me the right principles and the right values. And he always taught me that uh, principles and values are the only thing that are important. Minor things you can give way all the time, but on principles and values you don't compromise. And that was one of the teachings of my father. Otherwise, uh, I think that uh, my career in human rights law and as a defender of the rule of law did not depend on my father's experiences. So you were influenced by your father in terms of like going down this road of specializing in human rights law? I don't believe that there was a direct influence. My father never taught me to set the scores. My father taught, taught me to fight for the things that, that I believed were important in life. Uh, and uh, What influenced you then? What? What influenced you then? What influenced was the, the historical text, context of the 1970s and 1980s. In 1970s and 1980s, uh, human rights were taking a plunge, a very, very awkward, a horrible plunge. And uh, I was, at the time, I was specializing in civil law, not in constitutional law or in human rights law, civil law. And uh, I noticed that the abuses were increasing, but the complaints were not increasing in, in proportion. And the reason was that many victims of human rights abuses were finding it difficult to find lawyers to uh, put their claims in. And uh, I started getting the reputation of go to Vanni Bonello, my Bzash. And that's how I, my career in human rights law started. Uh, that I wasn't scared is a fable. I was scared witless because the, the, the intimidation was very, very uh, palpable and the protection from the parts of the judiciary, let me emphasize parts of the judiciary, was zero. How has Malta's relationship with human rights evolved over the years? I mean, can you identify key milestones along this development? Uh, I would say that we've gone from one extreme to another. One extreme was, there was a time when I started my human rights career that for the courts, nothing was human rights. However grievous, however violent the abuse, it was not human rights. Now I'm afraid we're going to the other extreme. Everything is, has become human rights. Every trivial, silly complaint, w some people try to uh, pigeonhole it into the human rights. So both extremes are wrong. I think, the, 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 as, as usual, the right way is the middle way. Not too complacent and not too aggressive. Um, your critical assessment of British behavior in Basra and Iraq uh, led to a landmark human rights decision. Let me play the devil's advocate. To what extent do you think your father's treatment by the British influenced your perspective on this case? I'd like to believe that it did not influence me at all. Because, as I said before, my father never taught me that I should be uh, one of my objects in life would, should be to settle scores. Uh, I think what happened in, in Basra after the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq was in itself uh, the right stimulus to change the law. Uh, if I can recap very briefly, the Basra uh, problem was that after the invasion was over, after the hostilities had stopped, the Americans and the UK uh, partitioned Iraq for areas of influence and of control. And the United Kingdom was assigned 
the Basra region. The war was over, there was no hostilities. And during this post-war period of relative peace, uh, the, the, some, some British personnel behaved very badly in Basra. There, were, there was torture, there was kidnapping, there was murder. And in the, in the area where the British were in control. The relatives of the victims of these British abuses, I repeat, not all, many behaved very, very correctly. But the relatives of the victims of abuse sued in the United Kingdom for the abuse of human rights. And the British government defended itself. It said, no, we, when we signed the Convention of Human Rights, we signed to respect human rights in the United Kingdom. Uh, we did not sign to respect human rights abroad or anywhere, or anywhere else, sorry. And uh, the courts agreed with the British government. Abuses of human rights committed outside the geographical area of the United Kingdom were not subject to, to control by the, by the European Court of Human Rights. The victims, or rather the relatives, of some of them were murdered, were, were killed. The victims took their case to Strasbourg. And for the first time, the Strasbourg Court, uh, I must say very much with my concurrence, uh, came to the conclusion that no, when you, con when you undertake to respect human rights, you undertake to respect human rights in your own territory and in every other territory under your control. And Basra was un under the control of the United Kingdom Armed Forces, so they were bound to respect human rights. This opened a new vista on human rights protection. A country is obliged re to respect human rights wherever it has some form of control. Uh, tell me something about your separate opinions, the, one, the ones, um, your separate opinions on the European Court uh, judgments. What impact do you believe they have? Uh, I believe that separate opinions, separate opinions can be either dissenting or concurring. You can dissent when you don't agree with the conclusion. And you concur when you agree with the conclusion, but not with the reasoning that led to the conclusion. And, uh, I've discovered that I wrote 53 opinions, separate opinions. And separate opinions have a very important role because a separate opinion is usually in the minority. But with time, it has happened repeatedly that what was yesterday's separate opinion becomes tomorrow's main leading opinion. And that way, I agree that with those courts, not, every, not all the courts in the world agree, that when a judge of a collegiate court, which is, or a court which is made up of more than one judge, disagrees either with the conclusion or with the reasoning, he is bound, morally bound, to express publicly why he disagrees. And this expression of public dissent has led to improvements in human rights law.